In our last video, we're going to be putting everything together from quantum chemistry in order to visualize particles in 3D space. So if we remember the story so far, we considered the three types of energy. We first looked at translation, so kinetic energy. And we did this by looking at the particle in the one dimensional box. We then took the principles from the particle in the box and adapted them to look at a particle in a ring to start to consider rotational energies, so angular momenta of rotating particles. And that rotating particle in a ring could be used in a number of ways, whether rotational spectra of molecules or electrons moving in an aromatic system. We then looked at vibrational energies, where we combined kinetic energy and potential energy into the harmonic oscillator model. And in the harmonic oscillator model, we saw the effect of having this finite potential. We get tunneling happening, where we have a probability of finding the particle outside the limits that we predicted by theory. Now, in order to complete the picture, we need to consider electronic energies. And to do this, we're going to look at the particle in a three-dimensional box. The key point of study here is the hydrogen atom. It's the only atom for which we can determine the wave function, because we have a single electron and a single nucleus. We simply reuse the same solutions over and over again for bigger and bigger atoms, but the problem is once we put more electrons in there, the equations become too complicated. So all of our understanding of atomic orbitals is based on a hydrogenic atom. The general approach we use for this is the same. We identify the energies that we're going to be considering, and we solve the Schrodinger equation for that particular set of energies. So what energies do we need to consider in the hydrogen atom? Well, first of all, we need to make an approximation. We assume the proton, because it's so massive relative to the electron, is fixed in space while the electron moves around it. This means we only consider the electronic motion. This is what we call the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And this allows us to simplify our situation so that we only consider two energies. We consider firstly the kinetic energy of the electron, and we consider the coulombic potential between the electron and nucleus, the potential arising from the difference in the electric charge between them, which varies as a function of distance, which if you remember from last semester, takes the form of the potential is a negative one over R relationship. So slightly different from the harmonic oscillator, but it gives us a potential for the electron around the proton. So let's go into our 3D box. There are two strategies we can take for that. So we have the 1D box that we had before, we extended it into a 2D plane, and we can extend that again by adding a third dimension Z to give us a three dimensional box. So as I say, it's the same method that we use for the two dimensional plane. When we look at the Schrodinger equation, our energy operator becomes this big thing here at the start. So we have to consider the motion in the x, the y, and the z directions. And we need to add in the potential energy term as well. Initially, this looks very, very complicated because we have our x, y, and z components to determine. And then from those, we need to calculate what the r distance is so that we can determine the potential energy. An alternative approach is to move to a different coordinate system like we did with the particle rotating on a ring. So we define the position in terms of polar coordinates. In this case, we're talking about r, phi, and theta of the position of the electron around the nucleus. And the nucleus, by definition, sits at the center of that polar system. This allows us to separate our radial and angular components. And this is exceptionally helpful, because if we look at the Schrodinger equation, we have a potential energy term, which conforms to a radius. But if we then go into angles, then all the angles are doing is at a fixed radius, what is the motion of this particle around the nucleus. So it allows us to completely separate the coulombic potential from the kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is effectively the angle of rotation or the rate at which the angles change, while the coulombic potential is the rate at which the radius changes. Visualizing r, phi, and theta can be quite tricky. I've produced this diagram to show that first of all, theta rotates down from the z-axis, and then phi rotates around the xy plane and r gives us that radius from the origin. So just to recap, the phi angle goes around the xy plane, and because it's a full rotation, it can vary between zero and two pi, while theta is the angle from the z-axis and can only vary from the positive z-axis down to the negative z-axis, which is an angle of pi. It's a half rotation. So we've looked, seen coordinate systems like this before, these spherical polar coordinates before, except you may have seen them in a slightly different context. Whenever you've considered latitude and longitude as a position around the Earth's surface, this is a form of spherical polar coordinates, where we have a distance from the North or the South Pole, and we have a distance around the equator. They use slightly different reference points, but the principle is the same. 
We don't use the radius when thinking about global positions because we tend to think about being on the surface. In this way we can think of our kinetic energy moving across the Earth's surface as a rate of change of angle, while our gravitational potential energy is our height above the Earth's surface. So that allows us to separate those energy terms. Phi works just as before with rotations, and it depends on the quantum number ml. Theta, on the other hand, is slightly more complicated, but it relates the quantum numbers ml and l together, so the angular momentum quantum number with the angular number. When we multiply our wave function for the phi and theta together, we get something called a spherical harmonic. Now, a spherical harmonic is something that you have come across before, it immediately seems confusing. You don't need to understand them, but you will immediately recognize the shape of them when you see them. So examples of spherical harmonics are shown here, where we have one spherical harmonic of this shape, another in this shape, and you'll immediately recognize these as shapes of atomic orbitals. Spherical harmonics predict the shapes of them, and they are how a wave moves across the surface of a sphere. So at fixed radius, how does a sphere deform to carry that wave around it? And these orbitals give an example of how the sphere would be expected to move. Because of the standing wave nature of these harmonics, it allows us to find the solutions to the Schrodinger equation, which predict where we can find electrons at a given potential term. Atomic orbitals are fundamentally sh solutions to the Schrodinger equation in three dimensions. It's quite tricky to visualize what's going on inside this, so let's slice through it because it's easiest to visualize it in two dimensional cross sections. So this allows to look at the electron density inside this orbital. So you imagine we've just sliced it top to bottom and we're looking through a cross section of it. So looking at where the electron density can be found within this orbital, we can see that we have a main intensity peak above and below for this dz squared orbital, but we also have a probability of finding the electron out to the sides as well. So we can see where the electron density is. But we also see these two bl black areas here, these nodes appearing. These are what we call angular nodes, and they relate to the energies. So the more energy, or the higher the energy of the orbital, the more nodes we would expect to see. If we go back to our radial distribution functions from the atomic structure lectures, you saw that increasing n, so increasing that principal quantum number, increased the number of nodes we would expect to see. So let's take a look at the first few radial distribution functions. For l equals zero, if you remember, this is our s orbital. So our 1s orbital, we see a single peak, for our 2s orbital, we see two peaks, so we have a, a single radial node happening here. For the 3s orbital, we have two radial nodes appearing. When we look at the p orbital, so l equals 1, for the 2p orbital, remember we don't see a 1p orbital because there's no solution possible there, but our 2p orbital, we don't see any nodes at all. For our 3p orbital, we expect to see one node. And then likewise, when we get to l equals 2, that's our d orbital, so our 3d orbital, we see no nodes either. As we increase L, so as we increase our angular quantum number, it appears to decrease the number of nodes. So if we look at n equals 3, we have two nodes for the s orbital, one node for the p orbital, and no nodes for the d orbital. So it appears to decrease the nodes, which is in contrast to increasing n. We would expect to see the overall number of nodes increasing. But remember, we're only seeing part of the picture. We're looking at the radial function here, but we need to combine the radial with the angular. So what we need to do is visualize the probability densities for each orbital. If we look at n equals 1, that's our 1s orbital, we would say, there are no nodes apparent. Now the dark spot in the middle there is a result of the nucleus, that's why we don't see any probability of the electron in the nucleus, but there are no nodes around that surface. If we go to n equals 2, and we look at the 2s orbital, we see we have a slight probability of finding the electron around the nucleus, then we have a node around the middle, and then we have our main area of intensity that's the next step out, the next shell out. Whereas if we look at the p orbital, for the 2p orbital, we have our probability distributions above and below the nucleus and an angular node in the middle. If we now go to n equals 3, well let's look at the 3s orbital, we see we have two radial nodes. We have one in close to the center, another one further out. So we have three areas of probability of finding that electron around the nucleus. Looking at the 3p, again, we see two nodes. We see our angular node, which slices it in two across the middle, just like the 2p, but we also see we have that radial node that we saw in the radial distribution function. And if we go to the 3d orbital, we see two angular nodes going across and sideways, so slicing this orbital up as well.
So overall, for the n equals 1, we have no nodes. For n equals 2, we will always see one node. For n equals 3, we will always see two nodes. So this corresponds exactly to our particle in a box discovery, when we saw that we would always have one fewer node than the quantum number itself. What differs when we start looking at spherical coordinates is that we start to see different types of node appearing. We see we have radial nodes and we have angular nodes appearing. The radial nodes themselves correspond to nodes in the potential energy wave function, while the angular nodes correspond to nodes in the kinetic energy distribution. If we highlight these orbitals, we can see the nodes in slightly more detail. And fundamentally, we can see the shapes of them, particularly for the 3p orbital here. We see we've got the combination of the radial node, the circle there, and the angular node, the line going across it. When we consider the quantum atom, we said that the solution to the Schrodinger equation require more quantum numbers. So we said we talked about the principal quantum number, that's our n equals 1, 2, 3. And then we spoke about the angular quantum number, which describes the angular properties of that orbital. And then finally, we have the magnetic quantum number, which describes how ML varies. It describes the degeneracy of a given angular orbital. When we look at how these vary, we see our principal quantum number go up 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Because of the restrictions on L, we get different numbers for L as well. When n equals 3, there are three possible L combinations. Then when we look at ML, we see we have 1, 3, or 5 degeneracies, depending on the shape of that orbital. So this is starting to build a familiar picture for us. If you recall, there's a very significant thing that we look at almost every day in chemistry, our periodic table, which highlights different periods, where we have n equals 1 at the top, n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. This is our principal quantum number. So what's now happening with our angular quantum number? Well, if we look at our angular quantum number, l equals 0, we have our l equals 0 here. Remember, 0 describes an s orbital. That's the angular characteristic. And we also got one up here as well for the helium. If we think L equals 1, that describes our p orbital. So it appears here. L equals 2 gives us our d block, and L equals 3 gives us our f block. So going back to that model that we had before, in our existing understanding, the principal quantum number gives us the shell, so the period in which the atom appears in the periodic table. The angular quantum number tells us the shape of the orbital, while the magnetic quantum number tells us the number of lobes that we would expect to see, whether it's px, py, pz, dxy, dxz, dyz, and so on and so forth. To summarize the course, we've shown that there's an inextricable link between waves and matter, and fundamentally this has led to quantization. The fact that we have our particle in a box with these boundary conditions, we force quantizations of energies. The wave function fundamentally describes the wave behavior of matter, whether we're looking at kinetic energy in a box or the rotational energy of a particle rotating. And the overall wave function that we would expect to see is the sum of all the constituent wave functions within that system. When a system becomes sufficiently large, we start to see traditional classical observations. So classical physics, remember, we have a continuum of energies. We can have energy, any energy we want, but with quantum mechanics, we force quantization. And through this course, using very simple models, we've been able to predict observable results using that Schrodinger equation and the principles of quantum mechanics. Looking at the models that we've used in quantum chemistry, we modeled kinetic energies using a one-dimensional box. Remember, confinement leads to quantization and predicts the electronic energies in pi-bonded systems. It readily extends to a two-dimensional plane by multiplying the two wave functions for x and y together. We then considered angular momentum around a two-dimensional ring. We have this cyclic boundary condition, so the wave function has to match up with itself after one full rotation. And we showed how we could simplify a two-dimensional xy problem to a one-dimensional problem just by looking at the angle, and that led us to our angular momentum quantum number. We then considered what happens with vibrational energies. We looked at the harmonic oscillator, and fundamentally we looked at what happens when you combine kinetic energy with potential energy. So we have a system where there's a finite potential, and that shows the quantum behavior approaching classical behavior, as well as showing quantum tunneling at the edge where there is a finite potential. And then we looked at the effect of atomic orbitals. We looked at what happens with electronic transitions in atoms by considering a three-dimensional box. But instead of looking at it as an x, y, z box, we looked at it as an r, phi, theta sphere, which allows us to completely separate the potential energy from the kinetic energy in terms of the Schrodinger equation. The solutions to that Schrodinger equation, the wave functions aren't trivial, so we haven't shown them here, but when we plot the solutions, they give us the familiar shapes of the orbitals that we've seen before. And we've noticed that we have an increasing number of nodes 
with our principal quantum number, but we need to determine whether or not they're angular or radial nodes.